Hello! It's time for another adventure. Um, today we're exploring the Anne Eve Moss collection um, on episode 10 of Archival Adventures. I'm Anthony Wright de Hernandez, Community Collections Archivist here at Virginia Tech. Uh, before we begin, a couple of acknowledgments to make. We acknowledge the Tudelo and Monacan people, who are the traditional custodians of the land on which we work and live, and recognize their continuing connection to the land, water, and air that Virginia Tech consumes. We pay respect to the Tudelo and Monacan nations and to their elders past, present, and emerging. We also acknowledge that Virginia Tech's Blacksburg campus was previously the site of the Smithfield Plantation. At any point from 1774 to 1865, the Preston family enslaved 40 to 100 African men, women, and children on this land. We pay respect to those souls and acknowledge that Virginia Tech is undeniably tied to this legacy. Further, we acknowledge that Virginia Tech's Blacksburg campus was previously the site of the Solitude Estate, which enslaved at least 30 African men, women, and children on this land. We acknowledge the contributions of the Fraction family and the un other enslaved persons in the creation and emergence of Virginia Tech as a major land-grant university. I also just want to mention that um, I definitely personally stand in support of the Asian um, the Asian Cultural Engagement Center, the Asian Community Connected with Virginia Tech. Um, the news today has been particularly difficult for that community, um, especially with the past year of increased um, I increased hate towards the Asian community that um, has taken the form of violence in many cases. And so I just wanted to acknowledge that and say that um, I personally care what happens and I, um, my heart goes out to the Asian community today. Um, hi, Orangitis, <laughs> welcome. Um, so yeah, uh, I'm gonna move into content now. Um, we, we are looking at the Anne Eve Moss collection today. Um, and to start, I think I'm gonna pull up the, um, sorry, I'm, I'm very distracted. Uh, I'm gonna pull up the finding aid and we'll get a little bit, bit of background on Anne. Um, for that, I'm gonna go to the screen sharing one. Lots of moving parts. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> Um, let me see if I know what I'm doing. Uh, I have too many things to pay attention to at the moment. And I think people just showed up. One second, I'm going to switch back to the other view and welcome people in. Um, many things to look at. Yes, 16-bit so Eric, thank you for the raid and uh, welcome in whimsies. <laughs> Uh, welcome to Archival Adventures, um, the show here at Virginia Tech where um, I, the Community Collections Archivist, uh, look at materials from our collections and share them on, on Twitch for everybody to enjoy or learn from. Uh, today's episode is episode 10 and, uh, <laughs> wow, okay, uh, I, should, I should welcome people properly. Um, <laughs> Rel redeemed a stretch, so I'm going to stretch while I do this. Um, Lord Portico, thank you for the resubscription. Um, Adventures of Tony, welcome in. Melba, welcome in. Rafe, thank you so much. Um, Rel Fexiv, thank you. Uh, uh, welcome. Bibliotech, welcome in. Um, and, and Adventures of Tony, redeemed to hydrate. Um, so yes, anyway, <laughs> today's, today's material that we're, uh, we're focusing on for Archival Adventures is the Anne Eve Moss Collection. I was just about to get into who Anne Eve Moss is. Um, <coughs> I just want to pull up so that I can see the chat 
while I do this. Um, there. Because I have to switch this view, and we'll, we'll take a look at her bio. Um, a little bit of information about her, and whoops. I didn't mean to do that. Here we go. <laughs> All right, Anne Eve Moss. Uh, these papers cover 1920 to 1990. And um, biographical information. Anne Eve Moss was born in New York City in 1903. She took singing and dancing lessons in high school and began performing on the professional stage by the time she graduated. She married Harry Moss, a theatrical agent, in 1922. She spent the years between 1922 and 1930 as a Ziegfeld Follies chorus girl in such productions as The Three Musketeers, Garrett Gaieties, and Funny Face. Um, she also modeled for the New York Daily News advertisements. And in 1924, she gave birth to her only daughter, Marilyn, who was later known as Alwyn and um, is a, an author with numerous publications under her name. Uh, but in, so in 1928, Anne refused to audition in the nude for producer Earl Carroll's show, Fioretta and she brought charges against Carroll before Actors' Equity, the theater union, and won the case in January 1929. So this is who we will be looking at today. <laughs> um, also, I think, let's see, just trying to make sure I'm keeping up on things. Bibliotech, thanks for the follow. Um, <laughs> anyway, so, uh, <laughs> there's more of this bio here. In the late 1930s, Moss traveled to Europe, the beginning of a series of trips abroad throughout the remainder of her life. Upon her return, she launched into a writing career. Um, a draft of a novel, Katha's Sister, based on her experiences on the stage. Um, her marriage ended in early 1940s, and she became a freelance secretary. Her employers included Eric Frome, Rollo May, Countess Mona Bismarck, for whom she later worked full-time as an administrative secretary on her estate in Capri, Italy, and Paul-Pierre Matisse, son of the painter, for whom she worked in Nice, France. Uh, during <laughs> this time, she also worked on another novel, A Widow's Odyssey, uh, which is unpublished. Uh, she also has other shorter works, including children's books, The Friends of Tinkle Rescue Club, The Friends of Tinkle Rescue Club, and The Runaway Balloon, um, Friends of Tinkle was published, Runaway Balloon was not. She moved to Nice in the mid-60s and returned to the U.S. in 1975, settling in Greensboro, North Carolina. And then in 1981, she moved to Floyd, Virginia to live with her daughter. And in 1984, moved to, re moved to a retirement community in Blacksburg, Virginia, and she died five days before her 85th birthday. Um, so she has a couple of reasons why she would be uh, someone that we would be interested in collecting material from. At one point in the past of uh, the archives here at Virginia Tech, we were interested in collecting um, material about theater, uh, especially community theater, but at the time they were kind of acquiring any material about theater broadly. So that's one. Uh, two, she would fit our requirements for wanting to collect materials about local history um, since she lived in Floyd, Virginia, and then later in Blacksburg, which is where Virginia Tech is located. So um, local history as well as theater history uh, would have been of interest for potentially acquiring this collection. Um, I'm not 100% certain which one is the reason that we have it, but also um, this collection was donated to us. So uh, the, the donor, who I believe was Anne's daughter, um, would have chosen us, and then we would have decided whether or not to take the collection. Um, it looks to me like we acquired this in 1990. Um, so I'm not 100% certain of the time frame of when we were looking for materials about theater, but I'm, I suspect that this probably lines up to that period. So I'm going to go ahead and pull out materials <laughs> and we can start looking at them. Um, I have my gloves because there are some photographs in this collection. Oh. 
And so I'll show the box here, this archival box. And you can see it's got a yellow tag on it that says restricted. Um, there are some restrictions on this collection, particularly around um, the ability of people using it to be able to publish the unpublished manuscripts. Um, that is something that's not allowed. The, the publication rights for the material were retained uh, by the donor. Um, and so there are restrictions on this collection. And that's all noted in the finding aid too. Um, so I'm gonna pull out the first couple of folders from this first box. Um, after that, there's the manuscript for Katha's sister, and then a couple of other folders. Hi, Librarian Liz, thanks for the resubscription. <laughs> you have mini ones for your business cards? I have my business cards in mini archival boxes too. Um, let's see, I'm gonna switch this over to the document focus so that I have that camera ready and I can monitor both chats here. Um, all right, first folder here is 1900s to 1940s family photographs. So that is the first folder in this collection. Um, and this, this is a challenging decision for me about whether to use the, uh, the gloves or not. Um, it seems like for some of them I will want them and, and one of them has paper that's falling apart and I will try not to uh, catch the gloves on it. Gonna pull the folder out of here and we'll look at the materials. So, lovely little family photograph with Anne and uh, Harry, or was it Henry? I've already forgotten his name because this is her collection. Uh, <laughs> let me check. Um, Harry. Anne and Harry with their daughter, Marilyn. That would be lovely family photograph. There, we will get to newspaper articles. There are newspaper articles about the, the case. Um, just a torn photograph. Unclear who's been torn out of it. Or if, if there was intent behind tearing it. Um, one of the things that I wish, I wish whoever had um, accessioned this, so accessioning, that's the process of bringing in a collection. I wish whoever had accepted this collection had asked for names on the people in the photographs. I suspect that this photograph is probably Anne's mother and siblings along with Anne, but I don't know because they're not labeled. Um, but that would be my guess. And I'm, I would suspect that, see, this is going to either be Anne or Marilyn. But I, again, I don't know because it doesn't really tell me anywhere. But here we've got a layout from like a scrapbook some beach pictures up at the top. This one just seems out of place on that page. I don't know that that's where it came off of. Um, it's got the same um, kind of jagged edges as the other photographs. Um, but it just doesn't seem to fit with all of the beach photography that's on this scrapbook page. And the scrapbook page is the one that I just, I can't manipulate the page with the glove on. So we're going glove and hand here. <laughs> glove to touch the photographs, 
hand to touch the paper. Um, this is like a nice little seaside vacation. I'm guessing vacation. She was primarily based in New York for the most of her time. And this, I'm uncertain exactly where it is. There's definitely some palm trees, but pine trees as well. So I'm not sure, possibly multiple locations or California. But we'll see. Or we <laughs> we'll see. I, we won't see because I don't have the information. But um, And then there's this older one. Or not older one. This one from when she was older. And I love the little Halloween one that's here next. With everybody in costumes. So a couple of faces to like give to people just before we get started with the actual uh, documents in this collection. I wish there were more names, but this is definitely Anne here with a bunch of kids in costume around her. And like I said, she did. She was a children's author, a published children's author, in addition to having written um, some works for adults. So. <laughs> Billy attack. <laughs> Thank you. Um, okay. I think that's everything I need the gloves for today, but I have them here in case I need them again. Um, the next folder is clippings from the 1920s. So this is going to be the stuff about um, either her modeling in the New York uh, what was it, New York Daily News, or about the court case involving her allegations against Earl Carroll, or if not allegations per se, she won the case, so um, involving Earl Carroll's reprehensible behavior. Um, <coughs> let's zoom out so you can see this. Carol gives girls nude test. Let me try and get this zoomed in properly. So this is the New York Daily News, December 14th, 1928. <coughs> and it's the banner headline. Two rejected applicants tell woes to actor's body. Uh, by Irene Kuhn. Girls of tender age, many of them not yet 17, have been required to display their nude bodies to the exclusive gaze of the theatrical producer Earl Carroll before they were given parts in his costume show Fioretta, now in rehearsal, according to charges made yesterday. Hi, Hannah. Welcome in. Welcome in. It's good to see you. Uh, 40 select... Oh, sorry. I skipped ahead. Uh, Miss Louise Blakely and Miss... Anne Moss Gaynor, both of whom tried out for the show and were rejected because they, they refused to comply with Carol's demands, made the charges in the offices of Chorus Equity Association, which referred them to the United States Attorney Charles H. Tuttle. <coughs> Tuttle could not be reached last night to say what disposition had been made of the complaint. Forty selected out of three hundred. The nude displays were ordered last Sunday night. It was revealed after seven grueling days of rehearsal, during which the girls danced eight hours a day and returned four, uh, and returned for night rehearsals in the auditorium of a hotel at 51st Street and 8th Avenue. From a throng of about 300 chorus applicants, Carol's stage manager and dancer producer Herman Hoover and Leroy Prince weeded out a group of 40. Despite the fact that the girls had danced all week in skin-tight bathing suits, and that's as much of that article as we actually have. So um, I have not gone digging to see if I can find additional. Uh, basically, I just would need to find a copy of the New York Daily News from December 14th, 1928. Um, but so she's named in here, Miss Ann Moss Gaynor. And there are a couple of names that pop up for her. Um, 
Daner was not her maiden name, and Moss would be her married name. I don't know where Gaynor is coming from, whether it was just a stage name, um, and I didn't see it in the documentation anywhere. Um, the, the only place I've seen Gaynor associated with her was this news article. So that was interesting. Um, oh, hey, it continues on the back. So uh, despite the fact that the girls had danced all week in skin tight bathing suits, the last, we lose the end of that sentence, but it, it continues here. Let's see, request saying it was all right and that it wouldn't take long, but she stuck to her refusal and left the theater without getting the call for morning rehearsal, which was given to those who had complied with the producer's extraordinary order. Carol last night emphatically denied the charges of Miss Blakely and Miss Gaynor through his attorney, Alfred Beekman of House Grossman and somebody. Um, Louise and Anne, and who was so we, we're definitely losing part of the article here. Uh, Louise and Anne, and who was hesitant to talk about the matter at all, concluded Beekman's statement by saying, as evidence of my good faith and to prove that these charges are false, I will give Miss Gaynor a part in the something show, and she, and we lose a little more sentence, um, accompanied by Daily News representative, went to register, com register her complaint. Miss Dorothy Bryant, head of the association, said that she would talk to Miss Gaynor at length today. You come in tomorrow and sign your complaint, said Miss Bryant. You're not the only girl who, and it's cut off. Curtain of the stage was drawn back to reveal pretty Joyce Hawley. She was in a bathtub, and like all ladies who step into bathtubs, was nude. When the loud noise, which followed in the party's wake, finally reached federal ears, Carol was summoned before the grand jury. He emphatically denied that Miss Hawley was nude or that the tub in which she sat and from which his guests had been invited to drink was filled with champagne. He seemed to treat the affair trivially until he was indicted for perjury. Then followed his conviction and a long and bitter fight which, made, uh, which he made for his freedom. But both the United States Circuit Court of Appeals and the United States Supreme Court upheld the lower court's decision sentencing him to one year and a day in prison and ordering him to pay a $2,000 fine. So this would be 1920s dollars. So 2000 is a bit of money, but honestly a year and a day in prison and $2,000 for sexually exploiting women seems a bit low. Uh, I'm missing some chats here. <laughs> well, Orangitis, I'm happy to um, have been able to shed some light on what archivists do. Um, if you have questions about the archival profes profession and uh, the, the work that we do, if you have any questions that you need clarification on, um, do let me know, I'm happy to I'm happy to respond or to provide context. That's that's part of this show. If anybody's got questions about archives and and what we do, um. <laughs> it's okay, Orangitis. Um, it seemed like a perfectly fine comment. So the the Mubat response wasn't in response to your your post. That's just a timed response that drops into chat. So that was not in response to you. Um, true, Hannah, he did serve some time, um, uh, unlike so many people today that uh, get off scot-free. Um, right, I'm going to pick up, resume, resume reading, but I will check back into the chats again. Um, when in a last desperate effort, Carol sought to make a personal appeal to President Coolidge, the latter refused to see him. Carol, blanched and cringing, started for, started for Atlanta, April 12th. 
but he collapsed as his train pulled into Greenville, South Carolina and was taken to a hospital there. For several weeks, he remained in the hospital in a semi-coma, and a fresh appeal was made to Attorney General John G. Sargent. The latter ordered an examination by physicians, and when they reported that the prisoner's trouble was mental rather than physical, he was ordered sent on to prison. He spent the first portion of his term in the prison hospital, but when finally he was released on parole, October 20th, 1927, and caught the first train back to Broadway, the crowd which met him found him, but little changed as a result of the grim penalty he had paid. So she's actually, the, the author of this article is actually relating um, charges that he faced, was convicted of, served time for all before the allegation of requiring the women to um, audition in the nude. So he went to prison for sexually exploiting women on the stage before requiring people to audition in the nude. Wow. <laughs> That's an interesting article. I'm looking at the next one, trying to see why it's here. I don't, so this one is not directly related to that one. Um, and this one is simply a, a picture, Orchard Street in 1898, about 100 years after it was cut through uh, James Delancey's Orchard. And handwritten on it just says, Chorus Girl from Orchard Street. So I'm uncertain why this one is here. But I showed it to you anyway. Because it's part of the collection. And so not knowing, like this would be if somebody wanted to research this, this court case or specifically part about um, you know, stuff about Earl Carroll, this would be of interest potentially. Stuff about Ann Moss. Um, this is definitely of interest, since these are this is her collection and this, these are her materials. Oh, there it is. I lost the folder for a second. Usually, uh, when we have researchers using these, um, they're not trying to run a stream at the same time. Um, here we have some of the ads that she was in for the New York. Uh, Daily News, let's see, is there going to be a lot of glare? Oh, there's a little bit of glare. Try and shift this a little bit. Well, I can read the text to you. You can see the photographs fairly well. Um, so this, this ad comes across kind of like a comic strip. And in the upper corner he here, this is, it's labeled Antics of Arabella. These girls teach you physical culture while they amuse you. Why did you buy so many hats? Um, I like to change my hat every time I change my mind. Uh, so these are like stand-up comedy, but in kind of comic strip form. And so they're doing physical exercise <laughs> at the same time as telling these jokes. And in the middle here, it says, for muscles of thighs and back, kneel on left knee, right leg extended in front, hands on hips. Keeping left hand on hip, bend forward, touching right hand to toe. With both hands above, head be bent backward, with both hands above head, bend backward as far as possible. Alternate with the left leg forward and repeat 15 times. Posed by Mary Dolores and Anne Moss of Three Musketeers. And then the next one, another three panel kind of stand-up comedy strip. There are a, th 
there are a few things that I can always count on. What are they? My fingers! Um, and that accompanies some free weight exercises. To reduce waste, stand erect, dumbbells raised above shoulders. Bend forward, knees rigid, throwing arms as far back as possible. Now straighten, raising arms forward overhead, bending back as far as possible. Back to number one and repeat 20 times. So that's some of the modeling work that she was doing. Let's see what else is in here. I did take a moment on Friday to kind of peek in the collection and get a sense of what was in here so that I could better choose which folders to share. Um, this one is another, so this one here, oh, this, the light glare here is just difficult. It's a nice photograph. She's in costume. Um, I'm not sure what it's from. It's, it's deteriorating a lot. I cannot take it out of the plastic um, or out of the mylar because it, it's just too fragile. Um, tells of demand for nude display. Dancer box. Charging that girls applying for parts in the new costume show Fioretta, now in rehearsal, were required to display their naked bodies to the gaze of Earl Carroll, theatrical producer, before they could get jobs. Ann Moss, above, brought her compa complaint to the actor's equity... Dot, dot, dot. It, it, it's broken off after that spot. Um, and this is from the evening something, evening graphic, it looks like. So given, um, given this, if I wanted to find the actual article and like read the entire thing, get it in its entirety, um, I would be looking for a publication called the evening graphic from around sometime in 1928. Um, and again, like, these are personal papers that were collected. They don't, I don't think this was a particularly, um, I don't think this is something that Anne Moss herself particularly wanted to highlight or remember in great detail about her life, this incident with the, the court case and being asked to pose in the nude for an audition. Um, later in life, she became an author. She had done many other things throughout her life. This was just a small portion of her life. Um, and so there are some clippings, but um, based on the way they're maintained, it doesn't seem like, she doesn't have like a big, big batch of stuff. She wasn't c actively collecting it when it was going on, didn't go back and find everything she could get about it. So um, these would be kind of like the seed of where to find material. Um, there are a number of different publications where we've got articles and you can get the name of it. The articles, the physical copies that we have are in uh, some poor condition. And so being able to find a copy of the New York Daily News or a copy of the evening graphic um, to get the full text of the article would be necessary in doing this research. Um, but without coming in and consulting the materials, you wouldn't know that. But here we have an item from the midweek pictorial, Fashions in Beauty. Uh, and so this is, Seems like possibly some modeling work, possibly just a write-up about her. <coughs> the caption for the photograph says, at left, Anne Moss of the musical production Music in the Air has her hair waved with the Vitron process. Her coiffure is short, falling into natural-looking waves with tiny ringlets at the ends. So yeah, this is going to be, this is modeling work. This is an ad for a curler, it looks like. Mm. 
here we have this appears to just be an ad for Ziegfeld Follies possibly it says oh you Walter you certainly pick some pips for the New York press for instance here's Ann Moss in Flo Ziegfeld's the three musketeers <coughs> how do you expect to keep us boys down on the farm after we've seen Anne? so definitely part of the allure and mystique of the Ziegfeld Follies was the physical attractiveness of the chorus girls in the shows um, so that's essentially a an ad for the Ziegfeld Follies um, there's some handwritten note the handwritten note on the back just says my press thanks June 28th no my press Thursday June 28th So that's her clipping uh, press releases featuring her, it seems like. Here we have the, um, the same photograph of her in that costume. <coughs> I don't know what show this costume is from. The previous time this costume was shown, it mentioned the show Three Musketeers, um, which was a Ziegfeld Follies show. Uh, so it's possible this was her costume for that show. I'm uncertain. Um, I have not done the research. That's merely my assumption based on the fact that in the other piece that used this photograph, it mentioned that show. Um, but this is from New York Amusements, and it's just um, basically a, a photograph of her. Um, New York Amusements, Broadway's official guide. So this is... Um, Similar, I believe, New York Amusements was similar to like Playbill, uh, which might be a name that you're uh, aware of today. Um, but it would have been, a, it, it's a theater guide, <coughs> essentially. Um, but this is clipped out, and it was clipped out just to show her. So I, this is going to be from like a show program or something like that. Um, but there's not even a write-up of like a bio of her or anything it's just the photograph there here we have Ziegfeldian Anne Moss one of the attractive charmers in Mr. Ziegfeld's lovely musical romance The Three Musketeers at the Lyric Dennis King is the star so just an ad for the Follies for, for The Three Musketeers show and then we have some more of her modeling work. Here is a catalog photograph where she is modeling an overcoat or raincoat of some sort. It is a fine wool poire sheen, which I'm not sure what a poire sheen is, but that's what she's modeling. It was $16.95. So I, I have, in the past, I've really enjoyed looking at um, like old advertisements, but I've never thought about who the, who the people were in the photographs until this collection. Uh, when it, be it was like, oh, Ann Moss modeled for these photographs. So this is like a catalog selling products, um, and she clipped it out because this was her work. This is part of her portfolio. But they are all very fragile at this point. Here's her feature. Um, 
the evening something. I, d I don't know what the full name of the paper is because it's it's cut off. Um, she's the one in the square fo frame here. Anne Moss, Garrick Gaieties, or yes, Anne Moss, Garrick Gaieties, Garrick Theater is the caption. Again, these are all, like not even cut out. They, they've been torn out of papers. Um, it's very interesting. And here we've got pieces, pieces of papers. Let's see if I can reconstruct. Uh, that nope I'm doing puzzles live on air out of archival news clippings <laughs> there's potentially some uh, preservation work that could happen with this to um, piece these together in a more stable way um, so that researchers don't have to do uh, don't have to essentially put together a puzzle to use them. Um. I have no idea where this piece fits. Show you what I'm working with here. These were all in a little plastic envelope together, but this piece doesn't appear to fit. Oh, it goes here. Article by Johnny Stuyvesant. That's a name that sounds familiar for anybody who pays attention to theater stuff. Let's see if I can find any more of that article. got more. I think I have the rest of the article. We might be able to read it. At least part of it. Let's see. Also, there are some uh, photocopies here. Maybe. Oh. Maybe that's. No, it's not. Actually, this might be the rest of that article that we we're reading at the beginning. We'll look at it in a second. Bathtub parties for me, says Earl Carroll. town sucker out with his some other bozo from his hometown he scraped acquaintance with one of the Mary Marys and asked her to get a girlfriend to make it a foursome I don't know this feels like it was saved for a reason but that only part of it is here which that what's here doesn't seem particularly germane to the rest of the material. Um, I could look at the... Ah, okay. It's possibly meant to be the flip side that we're looking at. You know, the side that has a big picture of Anne Moss on it. <laughs> Let's see if I can make this part come together then. News clipping puzzle. 
Here we go, here we go. This is generally the problem, or ge generally the way to approach. Um, if you put it together, and it seems like a lot of the story was cut out, it's probably the other side you're looking for. <laughs> um, let's see. Looking to see if it says anything about her specifically, and it doesn't seem to, like the stuff on the side here doesn't seem to apply. It seems like it's just the photograph in the center with the caption, Ann Moss, the little girl trying to hide behind the shawl, is one of the shining lights of the picturesque extravaganza, The Three Musketeers, staged by Zigfield. Or Zigfeld. Ooh, here we have one. January of 1929. Seems like we've got most of the article, and it seems like it's relevant to the court case. So we will look at this one. And we'll put these back inside the little plastic envelope they were in. Only I will put all of the pieces inside there so that the entire <coughs> item is together. All right. We have... Oh, keep your shirt on. Try and do this without breaking the page. Friday, January 4th, 1929. Just the camera here. There we go. Anne Moss, the pretty, pretty little cutie who became all hot and bothered when Earl Carroll insisted that she appear in the all together when applying for a job in one of his productions, is in the city. She is one of the beauty spots in The Three Musketeers at the Erlinger, and she still wears her comfy undershirt on her back instead of on a clothes tree. Anne, if I am not too familiar, believes that what Professor Carroll asked of her is something that is reserved only for her husband. When she decides to turn to kicking about cigarette ashes on the parlor rug instead of kicking toward the bad bald heads in the front rows, and when necessity arises, her chiropractor. Miss Moss is tickled to death that some gal and tune impresario has not seen fit to take the old saw about beauty being skin deep too literally. For when that happens, she believes the old Thurston trick of sawing a woman in two will be applied before the ladies of the ensemble are hired. Anyway, Miss Moss saved her shirt, and that is more than some folks are able to do these days in the theater. Florence Rudolph, prima ballerina and solo dancer of the Pennsylvania Grand Opera Company is... Yeah, so that that's the whole thing. There's another mention of Fioretta in the next column, but it's just talking about the show itself, not about the allegations or anything like that. The, the language used in this article, <laughs> like uh, this sounds like the, the society pages. Um, this is definitely not the journalistic language that we would expect today. Um, Ann Moss, the pretty little cutie who became all hot and bothered when Earl Carroll insisted that she appear in the all together while applying for a job in one of his productions in this city, could be translated to say, Ann Moss, who became upset when Earl Carroll insisted that she appear nude while applying for a job. Like, the, the flourish of the language um, appear in the altogether instead of appear nude. Uh, she's one of the beauty spots in The Three Musketeers, and she still wears her comfy undershirt on her back instead of on a clothes tree. Which is just commentary that, you know, it's, it's commentary about nothing, really. It's 
saying, yeah, she, she appears in The Three Musketeers, and you won't see her nude there either. Um, and she talks about, or, or the, the author talks about, um, believing that, that what was asked of her is something reserved only for her husband. When she decides to turn, when she decides to turn to kicking about cigarette ashes on the parlor rug instead of kicking toward the bald heads in the front rows. So, nudity is something reserved for her husband when she's at home and not for the audience at the theater. Um, and when necessity arises, the chiropractor. So that, that would be another place she would take her shirt off, would be the chiropractor. Um, and then it talks about, it says, Miss Moss is tickled to death that some gal and tune impresario has not seen fit to take the old saw about beauty being skin deep too literally. For when that happens, she believes the old Thurston trick of sawing a woman in two will be applied before the ladies of the ensemble are hired. So making light of the, um, the fact that she was asked to appear nude so that he could see how pretty she was, to see if she was pretty enough to be on the stage, um, making a joke about, well, clearly it's a good thing that he, he doesn't buy too much into the idea that beauty is, is more than skin deep, because if he did, then he would naturally want to see inside the person to see how pretty they were, based on the fact that he wanted to see under their clothes to see how pretty they were. Uh, it's the way it's written is, is really flourished, and it's quite an interesting way. But I've seen this, this kind of approach actually applied in some fiction as well, where people are trying to mimic that um, kind of that flapper time period, the, the vibe, um, and that's the, the way that fiction prose gets written when it's trying to evoke that time period, as though that's how everybody spoke at the time. Um, whereas the, the more hard news articles definitely don't have that tone. So that one having that tone I think was rather interesting. Some more of her modeling work. Um, here appears to be a still from a show, and then I've got, I have the remnants of a newspaper article, or no, just the remnants of a newspaper photograph, it looks like. This all appears to be from the same piece but again, it is in such poor condition. Um, I believe this is the photograph that I um, used in the flyer for today, on the, the, the tweet for today. I think this is the same headshot um, that I used for that, but this is what's in the collection, is this um, very, very damaged newspaper photograph here. And there's a story with it. Uh, Earl looks him over, and not even at blank, his appraising gaze when Earl Carroll something for his new show, Fioretta, charges when required to display their bodies to the... Uh, so it's, it's a news article about the story, about the, the case itself. Um, but again, there's... So the, there is stuff in here about the case, mostly news articles and things like that. Um, but not kind of as much as I think researchers or, or people would expect, given how central she is to the case. It just doesn't seem like it was of severe importance to her um, in the context of her entire life. There are a couple of items, but even in the newspaper clippings here, th 
there's a lot of stuff of just her modeling work and not tons and tons of news articles about that specific case. I'm glad you're um I'm glad you're able to follow along and that you're enjoying uh Tony. It's it's good to have you here. Um So this next one is called 1920s Playbills. And we have America's Authority on Dancing and Dance Music Dance Review. June 1923 issue and zoomed out as far as I can zoom. Price, 25 cents. Uh, Olof Destin, a noted character dancer. Inside or no? On the back? No? So on the back, We've got some ads for shows. There's nothing on here particularly about Anne herself. The photo on the front appears to be labeled um, blah, 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 appears to be labeled Olaf Destin, which I would assume is the performer who is on the front. Um, There's some uh, commentary written on the side there. I'm unsure if it's related, and it's been erased. Um, it's still somewhat legible. Subtitle, carrying something too far. Here, we actually do have a revised running order for Garrick Gaieties, which was one of the shows that Anne was in for the Ziegfeld Follies, <coughs> the Ziegfeld Follies. Um, so on the playbill here, I'm gonna actually try and zoom in a little bit um, so that you can maybe see the smaller text here. At the very top, we have a fire notice. Look around now and choose the exit nearest your seat. In case of fire, walk, not run, to that exit. Do not try to beat your neighbor to the street. John J. Dorman, Fire Commission. Uh, so revised running order, evenings, 8.30. Matinees, Thursday and Saturday at 2.30. The Theater Guild presents the Theater Guild Studio in The Garrick Gaieties. Music by Richard Rogers and lyrics by Lawrence Hart. Production directed by Philip Loeb. Musical numbers arranged by Herbert Fields. Setting and costumes designed by Carolyn Hancock. Orchestra directed by Richard, Richard Rogers. One, six little plays in which the gaieties bury their parents with characteristic disrespect and make a prophecy as to the evening's outcome. Undertaker, Philip Loeb. Arms and the Man, Betty Starbuck. The Glass Slipper, Blanche Fleming. Merchants of Glory, Jack Edwards. Androcles and the Lion, Romney Brent. Goat Song, William Griffin. The Chief Thing, Edith Miser. And the Garrick Gaieties, Sterling Holloway, Holloway and Company. And then we have Debach Song, a drama by Benjamin M. K. in which symbolism is solved with and vagueness vindicated. I'm gonna see. Kind of looking for for Anne because the collections about her and oh I found her. She was in. It appears she's in section nine here. Nine being Rose of Arizona. 100% American musical comedy in the best traditional manner by Herbert Fields. Rosabelle, played by Eleanor Shaler. Gloria Van Dyke, Blanche Fleming. 
Gustav Van Dyke, Philip Loeb, Alan Sterling, Jack Edwards, Kasaba Karamba, Romney Brent, Pimento, Edith Meiser, Mrs. Van Dyke, Ruth Morris, McFadden, John McGovern, announcer, William M. Griffith, and then The Flowers. And Anne was one of the flowers. Anne was chrysanthemum. So not a huge part, but there she is, uh, listed in the playbill for the Garrick Gaieties, which was a, a very well-known show in theater history. I'm uncertain what this is. But we have a, a page from a playbill this is the New York Magazine program, not, not Playbill, sorry. Um, from the show guide. Uh, it's a who's who in the cast page, but Anne is not one of the people featured there. Um, the run of show is on the other side with the musical numbers. Um, but I'm uncertain what show it's for. Melodies of May, I've told every little star. There's a hill beyond a hill. And love was born, I've told every little star. Eh, we won't linger too long on it. I don't see, I'm wondering if somewhere in these lists of names is Anne. But I'm not, oh, there she is. Members of the Iden, the Edendorf Walking Club. And Anne Moss is here with her name with an E on the end for once. Hi, Philip. With its ambiance music, old timey materials, and my narration, it sounds like Welcome to Night Vale. <laughs> I can't hear the music. I just put it on to a, uh, a piano channel. Uh, interesting. Well, I hope you're enjoying the experience. <laughs> if you want me to change the song, I'm happy to do so. Wait, Hannah, Sterling Holloway, as in the original voice of Winnie the Pooh? Where was that one? Was in the Garrett Gaieties. Uh, Sterling Holloway, H-O-L-L-O-W-A-Y. Let's find out. G-A-I-E-T-I-E-S. I hit the wrong button. Music is saving. Sterling Holloway appeared in all the sequels. Sterling Holliday Holloway. Yes, the same Sterling Holloway who did voice acting for the Walt Disney Company. Um, he was the original voice for Mr. Stork and Dumbo, Ka in The Jungle Book, and the title character in Winnie the Pooh. And he was in Garrick Gaieties um, at the same time as Anne Moss. Yeah, yeah I just had, had to go and double check. Um, it, is, it is the same Sterling Holloway. I enjoy old playbills. Um, 
we have a couple collections with quite a few old playbills and I will probably feature them on here sometime because I think they're fun. Oh, and here we have some more. So these are going to be like headshots and posed, posed photographs. Um, lovely one here. Zoom out. Just absolutely striking. Like the, the photography here is done really well. And she photographs really well too. Here is the one, um, one, one moment. Photographs, putting on the gloves for the photograph. This is the one that I used, this the headshot that I used in the um, promotional graphic for today. from her time in the Follies. It's very 1920s, but also not like the stereotypical flapper look. And now we're going to get a photograph of them on stage in the Garrick Gaieties. The Parade of the Flowers in the musical comedy burlesque The Rose of Arizona in the Garrick Gaieties, the musical review at the Garrick. So, if you can tell which one is the chrysanthemum, <laughs> Anne Moss is the chrysanthemum. I don't immediately, I, I can't immediately pick her out, um, and I can't tell which one of these is meant to be the chrysanthemum. Sorry, I also zoomed in way too far. Wanted to kind of be able to show off the different costumes and poses that they've got. stage Just some some photographs of her. Whoops. Let's see, what's this one? Interesting. The back of this one doesn't tell me what it is, but it says released for publication on condition that credit be given Drix Durea. So Drix Durea took this photograph. It's another stage photograph. And to me, like this is definitely going to be another like from a show 
a vaudeville type show, a, like Follies show, something like the Garrett Gaieties. But when I look at this staging, what I see the corollary to this today would be like a high school or college show choir. In, in so far as like they're all paired off man and woman uh, the guys are in Texas the girls are in or the, the women are in um, matching dresses uh, there's a featured performer in the front but this very much looks like the staging that you would see in a modern show choir performance Again, not telling me what it's from, but the photographer was Drix Jurea again. But it's going to be another scene from uh, one of the Follies shows. Oh dear. Crumbling paper and photographs together again. The gloves will rip the paper. The hands will potentially damage the photographs. Oops, I want to go out. Nope, <laughs> sorry, I apologize. I should be better at zooming this camera by now. So here we have some old, like it's, thicker paper, it's kind of like a construction type paper, um, which is very acidic, which is part of why it's falling apart. Um, the photographs here are not glossy. Um, they're very matte uh, photographs, and they've held up better than the paper that they're pasted into. Um, but they have cellophane tape on them, which the, they're starting to fall off because the cellophane tape, the adhesive has completely dried up. Um, and you can see the tape itself has yellowed over time because these, this was put together um, just with regular materials. These were not archival quality materials that were used here. Um, and this is what happens to paper and tape over time. various photographs of her in costume. Just, I would assume these are primarily from like a portfolio, um, actor's portfolio, similar to like headshots, but like full body shots. And then we have actual headshots. And so she worked, um, as we've seen, she worked as both a model and an actress. So these headshots would have served multiple purposes, potentially, in getting um, jobs on the stage or modeling work. I really like these sepia tone ones. The, a lot has put been put into like staging them and her, the curls in her hair. Um, they're very well done. And this one is stamped as a proof, <laughs> and she's cut it out. <laughs> I'm skipping duplicates where I can. Some of them are here multiple times. Hmm. 
this one is has a some writing on the back. This is the same headshot that we had before. The one that I used in the um, the tweet for today. Anne Moss, publicity picture, often in publications at that time, from Ziegfeld's Three Musketeers. Let's see. What else, what else should we look at? Do you all wanna see some of her writing that she did? Um, I have some stuff from the unpublished manuscript of one of her children's books that's got some really lovely art on it. Um, <laughs> here's an interesting one. We have a letter, March 28th, 19, or March 29th, 1935. So this is about five years after she finished with the Ziegfeld Follies. Trying to straighten things out. This camera likes to move around a little bit. A letter written to her husband, Mr. Harry Moss, Columbia Artists Bureau. He was a theatrical agent after all. Uh, Dear Mr. Moss, you sent me some photographs of Miss Gaynor, uh, probably as she was four or five years ago. I am sending you today a couple of poses as she is today. I really think the girl has possibilities. Of course, she lacks experience, but with the proper cooperation from Kellum, she should develop into an attraction here. She has a very pleasant voice and a nice personality. Of course, she was greatly handicapped by being with an entirely strange band. And as you know, Kellum has unusual arrangements on all his numbers. I think he has about decided she will add to the band. On the first two rehearsals, which I did not hear, he advised me that she was hopeless and could not possibly make it. I attended the next rehearsal and assured him that she probably has as good a voice as any singer we had had. So you are right in your contention that she has a voice, and I think with a little training and experience, she will undoubtedly be a success. I'll, I'll let you hear more from time to time. Let me know what you can think of the pictures. Yours very truly, Cece Cartwright, Vice President, General Manager. So, interesting feedback that was sent to her husband slash agent. And we know that she was, um, she apparently had worked under the name Anne Moss Gaynor, so that was referring to Miss Gaynor. Oh, and here we have the book. So circa 1940s, The Runaway Balloon. This is a children's book that she wrote that it was unpublished, so um, this one never did get published. It has some very interesting art, though, which is why I, what I want to mainly show off. We won't be reading the book. Um, because in some ways, if I was to read this book on, on stream, that would consist uh, publication in some ways. And um, as I said at the beginning, there are publication restrictions on any of the unpublished material here. So uh, the pictures are by Josie um, Sinote. The story is by Anne Moss. So we'll look at a little bit of this material. I don't want to damage this folder. I have another photograph here. Remember all the happy times we had? 
many photographs in this collection. We'll read the very beginning of it. This is the story of GB. GB was a balloon treasured by his owner, Tonio, because GB was the prettiest balloon on Tonio's balloon stand. And as soon as the children spied GB, they came near. All the children who came to buy balloons always wanted to buy GB first. But Tonio would shake his head and say, no, this one is not for sale. Pick another. And the children would choose from the other balloons while they looked longingly at GB the most beautiful of the balloons. Jeebe was beautiful because he was painted the softest of heaven blues, green like the sea and rose pink like a sunset, with cute ears that none of the other balloons had and big, curious eyes. Right. And Jeebe too would look longingly at the children as they went off, envying the balloons they bought, wondering what happened to them, where they went and what they did. Jeebe was tired of just flapping in the breeze tied to Tonio's stand. Jeebe was tired of not going anywhere. What's the use of being the most beautiful if you never went anywhere or did anything special? He grumbled to himself. So that seems like the start of a really cute little children's story. Um, as I said, I'm not going to read the entire thing. If you want to read it, um, you're welcome to visit the Special Collections and University Archives here at Virginia Tech or um, contact us for, with a reference request to be able to gain access to it. Um, it is freely available for you to consult. There are just restrictions on being able to publish it. Um, gonna look a little bit more of the artwork that goes, goes along with it because um, there are lots of little drawings of balloons. So first, just a lot of balloons. Nicely drawn, different shapes, but they're all identifiably balloons. And then, um, so the little girl that you can see, the artist is sketching out little female figures on the couple of photographs that we have. They're very similar to the girl in the drawings here who has this red balloon. And there's Mr. Tonio with his little spot for selling balloons and the balloons he's willing to sell. And here's the little um, string that GB would be attached to uh, going off to the center of the page and then the rest of the artwork isn't there. Um, These are painted. And then we've got various indications of potentials for GB, the balloon, which are just absolutely lovely. All different colors with the ears and curious eyes. He's a little sad there. He's got eyes, nose, and a frowny face. And because we haven't read the entire story, we're not going to know what all of these are referring to, but apparently there's a smiling sun and a cow. And remember, this is from the 1940s. So this artwork, this artwork is really nice. And the children's story seems really nice. There's lots of little sketches.
Here's, I'm guessing, a potential book cover. The Runaway Balloon, story by Ann Martin, pictures by Josie. I have a feeling if this had been done today, with the amount of work that's here, um, if this had been today, this probably would have been self-published. Because there's definitely enough work here. There is, like, the manuscript and enough art here that I could definitely see this um, being something that an author nowadays would just self-publish if they couldn't get it published somewhere. <coughs> it's all in a little folder that has full artwork on the front. Like, a lot of work went into this. See what's in the next box. We have circa 1960s, A Widow's Odyssey, the manuscript for that. 1975. Needs clippings. Ziegfelder Club. Good. Normally we put things away, or we ask patrons to put things back in the box after they're using them. I'm keeping them in order over here and they're all labeled so I can put them away later. And the only reason I'm doing that is so that I don't spend a ton of time putting things away on stream. And yes, there are a lot of boxes to my left. I don't think you can see them today, but um, most of them are not this collection. I have this collection and the next two that I'm going to be looking at on stream um, pulled. So this is 10-minute exercise elixir. bunch of addresses, so I'm not going to show that. And so this appears to be a book that she was working to get published. And this is an example of what was sent to 36 publishers from Literary Marketplace. The typist suggested a few minor changes, okay? Um, <coughs> I can't tell that Lauren Ann House. Uh, dear Ms. Oscar, we are writing you in the hope that you will be interested in a specialty cash register book booklet on exercises, one that we feel is different and replete with charm. The booklet contains an eclectic group of exercises stemming from the famous Tyringham Naturopath Clinic of Camberley, England. <coughs> London, pardon me. <coughs> <coughs> London Nature Cure Clinic, English Respiratory Hospital, as well as Russian, Indian, and Chinese authentic sources. The book will conclude with a meditation whenever one goes forth to meet the day like a gentle tiger. The text is written in calligraphy, decorated with original drawings, exercise figures, and applicable self-help words of wisdom. The booklet's inspired title is The Ten-Minute Exercise Elixir. May we send it? And the book itself. The 10-Minute Exercise Elixir. 
electric, e e eclectic exercises from here and there and around the world by Ann Moss and Ann Hart Hetter. By Ann Moss and Ann Hart Herrick. Illustration by Ann Hart Herrick. From A Green Oracle, Nothing to Excess. About the authors. So here, I think will be very interesting um, because this will be what Ann Moss has chosen to highlight about herself later in life. Ann Moss spent her younger years originally with the renowned Ziegfeld Theater. She is internationally traveled and a writer of fiction. She currently resides in Floyd, Virginia. And her co-author, Anne Hart Herrick, studied art in Boston under Liza Stieg, former wife of William Stieg, the cartoonist and sister to the late Margaret Mead. She has also studied art abroad and is a writer, currently resi resided in Chapel Hill, North Carolina at the time of <coughs> this was 75 to 81. So the contents of this book were uh, a s set of sedentary exercises by a naturopath healer from the famed Tyringham Clinic in Camberley, England. Respiratory from the London Hospital. Remedial from the Nature Cure Clinic in London. Russia's favorite wall exercise. Magic 4 derived from the I'm uncertain. Corners of the world. And then from China, a sprinkle of loosening Tai Chi. From India, a moderated yoga. Relaxation, massage from the elephant. In concentration, meditation and affirmation. <coughs> I think this is interesting that um, during her time in the Zieg Ziegfeld Follies, when she was doing modeling work, she modeled exercises and then later in life wrote a book about exercise. Um, ten minute exercise elixir. <coughs> And then we have Feasts Without Flesh. Dear Editor, Feasts Without Flesh, highly personalized. This creative vegetarian cookery book is an unusual anthology of recipes and ideas on, on food's impact on the whole person. Recipes passionately gathered worldwide throughout a lifetime of rich experience. And there's a uh, double asterisk there, uh, noting that Zigfield player and showgirl with famous pictures for publicity, administrative housekeeper of the estate of Countess Bismarck, the former Mona Williams of 10 best dressed fame, Capri, Italy, favorite secretary on special assignments for public figures as different as corporate execs to Eric Fromm, world renowned writer, psychoanalyst. <coughs> Recipes either original or with original touches melded into the basic classical and traditional. It has been created with the goals of metaphysical and physiological wholeness, plus simplicity and ease in cooking methods, engagingly diversified and interesting in the entire organization and contents of the book. It is intimately, warmly presented with capsule with capsule amusing and revealing scenarios of those the known and unknown who donated recipes. Illustrated with original drawings and meaningful self-help, relevant quotes of wisdom of the ages and sages, it is a timely, inspirational cookbook appealing to novice and skilled that encompasses the one cookbook to enjoy and live by. <coughs> that is not about Feasts Without Flesh. So these appear to be just multiple copies of this letter to editors about Feasts Without Flesh. Um, I don't actually have, it doesn't appear that we actually have the text of Feasts Without Flesh. <coughs> 
which sounds like it should be a vegetarian cookbook. I was curious to find out, but we, we don't have it. <coughs> so there's some news clippings in here about a chorus line that don't have anything to do with or mention of Anne herself. Not going to dive into those. There's other stuff to look at. Um, the Ziegfeld Club. The Ziegfeld Club Incorporated. September 25th, 10 a.m. And dear, uh, so good to hear from you this morning. And your picture is just beautiful. But you didn't have a piece of cardboard in it, and it was folded, and has two big cr cracks right through your face. We will see after the ball if we can have it restored. We are working around the clock. Uh, we are working around the clock here on the ball. Have to each year it gets harder, but each year the evening is the greatest ever. Keep in touch, dear. And keep in touch, dear. And beside me in the future to put I, I don't understand the sentence because that definitely says, and beside, me in the future to put cardboard and write, do not fold on envelope. This is a thank you note for sending a picture and the picture got folded. And so advice on what to do in the future there. <coughs> The Ziegfeld Club. I'm uncertain. I assume the Ziegfeld Club is a club that only includes people who performed in Ziegfeld shows. But I do not know. I was hoping that the materials in here would tell me. So far, they have not. Ziegfeld Club's Charity. Halloween Costumes Award, Dinner, Party, and Dance. Friday, October 29th, 1982. Do come join us at our tax-exempt Halloween costume party, where you'll dine, dance, drink, and dunk for apples. Have your fortune told. Enter the costume award parade, play musical chairs, dance the Paul Jones, the romantic game that first introduced Ziegfeld to his bride, the indomitable, beautiful Billy Burke. Enjoy special entertainment this bewitching evening on two fun-filled floors, the ballroom and dining room from 7 p.m. to 11 p.m. First seating, 7 p.m., second, 8 p.m. $30 per person, reservations limited to 250 guests. Re reservations must be paid in advance, none sold at party. Kindly make check payable to and send to the Ziegfeld Club. Your mailed tax-exempt receipt will serve as your ticket. Important notice. The Ziegfeld Club's 46th Anniversary Charity Ball Winter Festival will be held Friday, January 1st, 1983 at the Pierre, New York, New York. <coughs> Come as you wish. Costumed. Here are some additional suge costume suggestions. Uncle Sam, Statue of Liberty, Christopher Columbus, Queen Isabella, Alfred Lunt, Lynn Fontaine, Florence Ziegfeld, Billy Burke, 
Beverly, Still Beverly Sills, Peter Pan, Cinderella, Old Mother Hubbard, Witch, Choir Boy, Choir Boy, Annie and Dog Sandy, Belasco, Gypsy, Alice in Wonderland, Cardinal, Santa, Fagin, Justice with Scales, Red Cross, Visiting Nurse, Judge, White Wig, Miss America, Liza Doolittle, Dracula, Captain Hook, Chris Everett Lloyd, Romeo, Juliet, Little Red Riding Hood, Caruso, Pagliacci, Abe Lincoln, Henry Kissinger, Cleopatra. I find it very interesting that it says, come as you wish, costumed, meaning you have to wear a costume. <coughs> Let's see, we've got about 15 minutes left. I want to look at the book that she actually had published, the, the children's book that she had published. Hi, Be Right UK. Welcome in. And thank you for the resubscription. Three months. Thank you so much. So we have the Friends of Tinkle Rescue Club. Um. I do not know. I know that the that Tinkle is a cat. So we've got a cat in motion there. We have a handbook of cat care. So these are probably research materials for the book that she wrote. There's a um <coughs> Just a little card with a cat on it. I mean, this is the internet, so showing off cats is a good thing, right? And then there's a little drawing. And the title of it in quotation marks at the bottom is, My name is Tinkle. <coughs> Pardon me one second, I need a sip of water. All right. Friends of Tinkle Rescue Club. <coughs> Dear Editor. <coughs> Pardon me. I have a different extraordinary cat story for a small book for older children and grown-ups. An audience of millions. A true story. A spiritual, evolved cat who visited me from France to where I am now in the USA in an out-of-body experience. A talking cat, a cat with psychic ability and the most intuitive feelings, who holds serious conversations with people, mimics my voice. Tones, besides her own changing expressive tones, to communicate. Do you want to see it? With it is a collection of cat portraits of the cats featured in the story who have their role. About this little Siamese tinkle, a very deep one. I know, I've lived intimately with her traveling everywhere for many years. She is now over 23. She is now 23 or over. There is a sequel for another small book to follow, which is integral to the story's scheme. I hope I may hear from you. <coughs> Let's see. Friends of Tinkle rescue club. Photo of Tinkle. Tinkle is a Siamese cat who belongs to Anne. Anne, who lives in France, having a daughter in England where cats cannot freely enter, there is a problem to solve. How can Anne live with her, with her daughter in England and yet not leave her cat Tinkle behind in France? Many solutions are tried because Tinkle always suffers while waiting for Anne to come back to her each time Anne goes off to England, but Anne must go because her daughter works in England and must stay there. And, in so, and, and so, in trying to solve this dilemma, Tinkle has many adventures with many other cats whose stories are also told in this book. Back cover. Uh, of Pussy and Mitzi sitting on huge pillows 
on two huge armchairs, with Tinkle first sitting near one cat and then sitting beside the other cat. These being the two cats Tinkle temporarily is living with while Anna's away. <laughs> two unfriendly cats. Inside cover, same picture of cats on pillows and two pages facing each other, with Tinkle sitting beside each of the cats she lives with, um, with whom Tinkle is trying to make friends, sitting down beside them, something she had never done before during all the time she is living in the same house with these two cats, first next to Mitzi and then next to Pussy, who, by the way, is the biggest cat in the world, or almost. <laughs> Dear Blank, this book, The Friends of Tinkle Rescue Club, is, I think, an extraordinary cat story for all ages, suitable to be a small book, exciting in itself, but written to be followed by one or more sequels. It is a true story about a spiritually evolved cat with proven... Oh, I already read that, didn't I? And then we have the actual manuscript of the book, which... I will not read on air because it is definitely covered by copyright. Um, very interesting. And like I said, this one was actually published. If you go online and search for Friends of Tinkle Rescue Club, you can find it, I believe, on Google Books. Um, I will double check because I want to remember. Uh, Friends of Tinkle Rescue Club. So it appears to be on various non-US Amazon stores. Does not appear to be on the US Amazon store. But there is definitely an image of the book cover. There we go. Apparently $9 in the US Amazon store. Friends of Tinkle Rescue Club, published March 1st, 1991 by Anne E. Moss. Published by Pocahontas Press. The cover of the book does not match what was in here as the desired cover. So there was some stuff here in the miscellaneous notes and papers, if I remember correctly. Also, I need to start thinking about who we're going to raid, because we are nearing the end. And so I will probably leave this. There's more in here. There's more of her writing. There's um, additional stuff on the Ziegfeld Club. Um, it's a very interesting collection. Um, not as much on her time in the Ziegfeld Follies as um, I might have hoped. But um, certainly what there is of that is very, very interesting. Um, a lot of the bulk of the collection is taken up by actual manuscripts of um, a novel that she wrote that was never published, as well as um, children's books and other writing that she did, um, which was a large part of her later life. Um, so I hope that you've all enjoyed uh, kind of exploring the Anne Eve Moss collection with me. The um, Let me switch to the face cam here real quick. Um, and I will tell you what we're doing next week. Um, tapping on the wrong things here. Um, so next week, we are doing a collection called the Books That Made a Difference Project Collection. I hope. <laughs> I have not looked at it yet, but it sounded very interesting. It has a number of boxes with a number of papers. It also has some cassette tapes, and I don't believe I have any ability to actually play any of the material from this cassette tapes. Um, I might explore whether that's possible. Um, but let me tell you a little bit about it. Let's 
So a historical note about this collection. In a project jointly sponsored by the Center for the Book in the Library of Congress and the College of Arts and Sciences of Virginia Polytechnic Institute and State University of Virgi or Virginia Tech, the Books That Made the Difference project sought to discover how important a role books played in shaping people's lives. The project was planned, administered, and promoted by Anne, Heidbre Anne Heidbretter Eastman, Director of Public Affairs Programs, College of Arts and Sciences at Virginia Tech, and executed by Gordon Sabine, a professor of journalism at Virginia Tech, and his wife Patricia, an assistant professor at Ohio State University. The Sabines traveled across the country from July 1980 to March 1981, interviewed approximately 1,400 Americans, and asked them two questions. What book made the greatest difference in your life, and what was the difference? They interviewed a panoply of people, from cele celebrities and authors to farmers and laborers, who named books from the Bible to Raggedy Ann, and answers were collected for a book published in 1983 by Shoestring Press, Books That Made the Difference, What People Told Us. In addition, the Books That Made a Difference idea was promoted nationally with, for example, Gordon Sabine's interview on National Public Radio's All Things Considered, in which listeners were asked to write NPR about significant books in their lives. And as the theme of national library ceremonies, such as the American Book Awards, the concept, uh, the concept was also used on a local scale from promotional ideas for libraries given in the back of the book. Uh, in 1985, the Book of the Month Club published an abridged version of the book. So uh, the collection consists of administration and promotion subject files, center for the book material, magazines and newspaper clippings, uh, correspondence, manuscript drafts, Book of the Month Club material, and audiovisual material. So next week we will spend a couple of hours looking at the books that made the difference um, uh, project collection. It's, it's on the cart next to me. Um, which sounded very interesting to me. Um, I definitely had books that made a difference in my life, and I'm sure most of you have as well. So that's what we will, we will be looking at next week. And the week after, the plan is to look at the Lucy Herndon Crockett Papers. Um, so those are the next two weeks. And I hope you will stop by here on Wednesday afternoons to join me for those. Um, it was lovely having you all here. I'm going to look and see who we will send it over to today. Um, one second while I see who is live that I can raid. Mm. Well, I'm going to try and raid the North Carolina State University Libraries. Um, I know I can do it from the one channel. I'm not sure I can from the other one. We will give it a go. Uh, they are currently playing Stardew Valley, which is a very relaxing game. Uh, so I'm going to start this here. I'm going to try and do it here. Uh, last time I tried to do it from my personal channel, it did not work. But we will try. Nope, it won't let me. So we will still raid uh, NCSU libraries from there, and we will do the Monterey Bay Aquarium from the other channel. Uh, but it was, again, lovely to have you all here. Actually, nothing is letting me raid from this channel. Doo -doo -doo -doo. Technical issues. One moment, please. Raid and see. Start. We'll send you off somewhere at some time. We're going to say goodbye on the one. I'll get the raid going. Yes, OK. NCSU Libraries, Monterey Bay Aquarium. Enjoy the rest of your Wednesday, and thank you for stopping by.